you would, if I could ask you to stand with me this morning, it's a little bit different, but I've asked you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 5 and stand with me as we read this passage. Mm -hmm. I'm having a stand, we we stand, if if anyone is in Christ today, we're, we're talking about issues of of sexual immorality, impurity, talking about some heavy and interesting things this morning. And the reason I want us all to stand is so that everyone knows that if you are in Christ and there is anything in your past of any of this nature, you don't have to sit, you don't have to hide, you don't have to squirm through this sermon. If you are in Christ, he has forgiven and made you new. And if there is anything in your life today that needs to be dealt with, his light can shine on you, his forgiveness can be granted to you, and you can know him better and worship him more fully today because of what he's done. Amen? Let's read God's word together. Ephesians 5, I'm going to begin in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, no fool, no, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would grant us to hear these words, to meditate on these words in a way that your light would shine on us and through us. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we, we walk in sacrificial love, we walk as saints, we walk as children of light, we walk as imitators of God because of the identity and life we've been given in Jesus Christ. The call to morality is not be a good person so that you can be called a child of God or a saint or a children or a child of light. It's it's not be good so that you can have that. Rather, it is because of what Christ has done, if you have received that, you are a saint, you are a dearly loved child, you have been illuminated by him and therefore respond to that. Live like it. Christ has made you a child of God, so live in light of that. That's the the call here that we have to morality. And we talked last week in those first, went through that that was because of his love. For God so loved, when we consider that, to the extent that we see that, we're going to respond and imitate God. And in the same way, we looked at how we walk in love as or to the extent that we see that Christ loved us and gave himself for us. As as we look at Christ, as we consider Christ, as we give thanks, as we worship him for what he's done, there uh, uh, there is no way that there is not a real response to him. So there are many ways that we can be distracted from those things. But That is why we keep our eyes on the Lord. That's why we look this morning. That's why we throw aside anything that would hinder us because we want to see fully and completely 
so that we live as beloved children imitating him. So we live as those who are giving our lives away and loving others as we have been loved. So that's the, that's the picture, that is, that's the foundation that has been laid for us as we get into what Paul is now going to address um, for the Ephesians and the things that he's going to challenge them. You know, we're, we're meant to know God and make him known in all of these ways. So how is it, what are some of the ways that we do that? And... One of the statements we said last week in looking at love, because love can be a very, gen- that's what real love looks like. Love is sacrifice. Love is saying no to sin and yes to God's will. And so thankfully, Paul is going to start unpacking that for us in verse three. Look with me at verse three. But sexual immorality and all purity or impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So sexual immorality is translated from the word pornea, which refers broadly to sexual sins and fornication, you know, any sexual action that is outside of biblical marriage, um, any, any sexuality that is outside of what God has said is good and right. And you might recognize this word, pornea, as the root word for pornography, and I've heard some, you know, argue in our culture, oh, well, those are just pictures or, or whatever else in order to excuse those. But that is not what Jesus says. That's not what God's word says. Jesus said, whoever looks at another, at another one, or he specifically gave the example of whoever looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her. It, it doesn't have to proceed to inaction. It is because God is God over all things, heart, mind, body, soul. He sees all things. So the one who has is, who is made that decision has already committed adultery in his heart. So anything that causes us to look to or desire something other than what God has designed or said is good and right, we should say no to. In Leviticus... Um, in, in the law there, it's, it brings to the forefront the idea that basically to even uncover or view anyone else's nakedness outside of marriageness was considered a grievous sin to God. Okay, and it, and it has to do, I think one of the reasons that's so significant if we're looking at the totality of Scripture is that a person's body is It is their unique image, their thumbprint, so to speak, from God. They are made in his image. And that person's, each one of our identities is unique before God and valuable before God. And that is not, you know, to uncover someone else is to have part of their, to take part of their identity. Okay, to essentially, again, God knows that with the fall of man, it made it practically impossible, because yes, Adam and Eve were naked in the garden and unashamed, but that was before sin. So now with the, with the coming of sin, God knew it was impossible for man, again, to, to bear the image without there being some type of tarnishing or some type of, of dishonoring in the way that we would use that. And so the confines, the safe place that he gave in all of creation for that was the marriage covenant. So the unique image being created in God's image is a significant part of this. The only bounds given that are safe and purposeful are the covenant of marriage. Um, Corey and I, in our years of youth ministry, often told kids that basically, you know, sexuality... And sex itself is like fire. If it's in the fireplace, it's beautiful, it's warm, and it's serving its intended purpose. If you hide it in the closet, if you put it in the attic, it's going to destroy things if it's not in its proper place. In the same way, that is the way that God designed sexuality. The next word that's mentioned here is impurity. It's a very similar word. It simply means dirty or not pure. 
You know, any action or thought that comes from an impure motive or is not pure in God's eyes, we should say no to. Don't love or put yourself around what is dirty or profane. And this seems like an interesting place to us for Paul to start off with this. He's, he's starting with some, some real significant things here. And maybe it's because it was a big deal in Ephesus. Maybe it's um, because like he wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, he reminded the Corinthians that all other sin is outside of the body. Okay, but sexual sin is against your own body. And I say that to say Christianity has more honor and more respect for the human body than many other religions and philosophies. Our bodies are in God's image. Christ came in a physical body. We are raised and we will have a new body, a physical body, a form of our own. So Christianity does not teach that bodies are sinful and spirits are sacred. It's not like yin and yang, you know, one is of the earth and one is of heaven and they're together for a little while and then they separate again. No, Christianity has a whole perspective of who we are as created persons, body, soul, spirit. We are whole persons and God sees that. And so there's no distinction that what you do in your body can't touch your soul. So friends with benefits or anything of that sort is, is a completely foreign idea to the Christian. A physical body is a big deal to Jesus. In the early Gnosticism, saying, oh, Jesus just came back as a spirit. No. Jesus was body and spirit, and that is why he cares so much. Because it goes back to his original purpose in creation. God created the physical, the spiritual, all of it, and he wants to redeem all of it. He paid for all of it. So now Paul moves on to a word that perhaps seems strange to us in, in that list, given what he's just said, but he says covetousness. And you might think of the 10th commandment, you shall not covet. And uh, that is spelled out in Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your na- covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Okay, so it covers this picture of of lusting after a person, but it actually broadens that out to anything that's not yours, okay, that does not belong to you. Again, it really comes back to longing for the creation rather than longing for and being in right relationship with the creator. These things are, are not even to be named among those who claim the name of Christ. I was thinking about this, that each of these sins, all of these things are, are, that Paul mentions here, really what they are are personal responses that each of us might have when we come to a spot where we say, you know, God, what you've given me is not enough. Now, none of us verbally say that. But why does someone step into morality? Why does someone step out of the bounds of what is pure and right? Why does someone long for something else? Ultimately, at the heart level between, in our relationship between us and God, it is saying, what you've given me is not enough. Okay, we may not be saying, I want it all. Well, I just want this that you haven't given to me. I want something that you haven't given to me and I'm going to go after it in my mind or my actions and I'm going to go after it my way rather than trusting God, rather than trusting that what he has said is best or right or true, that he is sovereign over all that we have, all that he's given to us. Anything that would reduce us to purely physical consumers. Again, think about who Paul's talking to just in humanity. Okay, people just like us. 
who live in a world just like us where people are running after all the, the pleasures of this world, possessions, just going after only what we can see. That's the world we live in. So anything that would reduce us to purely physical consumers as being no bigger and thinking no farther than the immediate. If we are living before an eternal God, it makes sense that there's a complete disconnect. A life based on the temporal and running after things as if there was no God. And contrary to what he said, there's a complete disconnect if we're living that way and claiming God. Those two things don't come together. We are, we are whole persons. We are more than our appetites and what our flesh can want or our mind can imagine. Again, more than just the physical. God wants us to know all of him and his good design. And I, I think I want to say particularly to the younger folks in the room, but it, it obviously applies to all of us. It's not that God has forgotten that we're sexual beings, that he made these rules. It's because God knows that we are complete persons in our, our sexuality and our, the things that we desire in this world, the things that we run after with our lives, those are connected with our, our every aspect of who we are. They're connected with our relationship with him. Seeking the things of the world and, and, and running after those things and, and a sexuality that's outside of what he has said is right and good leads us to a place of shame and hiding from him and damaged relationships with others. But God knows that when sexuality is inside of what he has made, it actually causes us to praise him. It actually causes us to say, God, your design is good. It is right. And it blesses our relationship with others when we're not running over people to get what we want, when we're not worshiping the creation rather than the creator and all the things that we want to accumulate for ourselves. So it's, it's fitting. What Paul is saying makes sense. What fits God's children is in us being set apart and in knowing, in knowing that we are eternal beings made for more than just the physical, made for relationship with him and right relationship with others. It, it, it makes sense that we leave behind running after things in the way that the world is running after them. When we have a, a purely physical view you know, in, our, in our culture, it, it shouldn't surprise us. I can, I can think of um, a number of the construction crews that I worked on in a number of different states, and it's interesting, most of the lunch breaks or different conversations would often tend certain ways. And it was, you know, you know, who was, you know, who, you know, who people's exploits, um, you know, going after the, the next, what was the next possession? What was the next toy? What was, how far out were they from retirement? How far out were, all, all these things that basically were the world's level of status that became part of the conversation. It's not really a surprise that the, that the conversations sometimes were, it, what came out of those conversations was, was really base and not helpful to anybody. And, and I, I can't say I expect anything different. I was actually surprised sometimes how it revealed that my hope was more in possessions than it was in God. And it, it, it scared me, it convicted me of places where I was actually, you know what, am I just living for the next thing? Or am I living for the Lord? So I, I, I think of all those things, and, and so what flows out of, you know, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that shouldn't surprise us in verse four that Paul is addressing first these heart issues, these, these issues, and then again the speech that would flow from it. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Okay, talking in a way that celebrates or laughs at a distortion of God's design is totally out of place. 
Okay, there were many times as a young man where I should have walked away from conversations that were happening, and, but I didn't because I didn't want to look like a prude. I didn't want to look like a goody-goody. Okay, but there's no reason to allow that stuff to enter into our minds. I, I have this picture of, of a beautiful white shirt hanging on a clothesline to dry, and the wind blows it off and it falls on the lawn, and then a tomcat comes along and he takes a pee on it and then he poops on it, and he just let it sit there for a couple hours before it's discovered. Who wants to wear that? But yet, that's kind of that, if you were to pick that up, you would think twice before putting it on. And yet, in some ways, I think many of you can, perhaps, I, I hope you're not dwelling on it this moment, but you're thinking, yeah, I remember some conversations and some jokes that kind of felt like that. How is it that we're made clean in our heart and mind? It's by taking those things and saying, Lord, and, and for me, it's been, Lord, wash my mind clean. Wash my heart clean. For the, way, for the places and the times that I sat there and listened when I should have gotten up and left, Lord, forgive me and please, please wash my mind. Let me love your truth instead. Let me love your design instead, instead of the filthy talk and the coarse jesting and these things that at times I should have said no to and I didn't. And I, I think all of us know people who are, have so said no to God's design that they don't even notice anymore when the shirt gets pee and poop on it and they just put it right on. And no one wants to be around that. And yet Christ can wash even the vilest clean. I think of John Newton, who's a slave trader, the vilest of, of, of sailors. He had a sailor's mouth and a sailor's heart. And yet, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Just, just picture that. Christ can wash anyone clean. But these things are not, these things are not to even be named among his children. None of that should come forward from us. We should, we should flee, we should run. There should not even be a hint of any of these kinds of things in us. And so I want to remind us that Paul was writing almost 2,000 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> really, there isn't. You know, Ephesus was full of temple prostitution, every form of immorality, the coveting, the filthy jokes, you know, the, the speech that was, that was uh, antithetical to the way God designed things to be. And so God's word is, was, is relevant for us today just as much as it was in Rome. And so what does Paul give us as an alternative to these things? You know, we talked about verses 1 and 2. We talked about responding to who we are in Christ. But again, he tells us um, first that these things don't belong among his children and his saints like, like we looked at in verse 1 and 2 but then he makes a statement that's really important and it's such something that we would almost read right over the top of oh yeah and give thanks that's, that's, that's not I think the way that Paul wrote it but instead rather than those things coming out of your mouth rather than those things being your lifestyle let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Well, so how does thanksgiving stand in contrast to dirty jokes and immorality and covetousness? Well, I'm glad you asked, okay? Um, you know, first of all, who is it that we're giving thanks to? We're giving thanks to God. And what is it that we're giving thanks for? Well, I would say everything. <laughs> it's, there are so many aspects to give thanks. As you look as it relates to these specific things, you know, say for the single person, you might say, well, what does this have to do with the single person? To the single person, to say, God, I thank you for your design. And even though you have not given me a mate, you have put me in this situation, I trust that your purposes for me 
here because you have not given me a spouse are great. And I can bring honor and glory to your name just as Paul did as a single person. Thank you, Lord, that you are trustworthy and good and sovereign over my life. And so I am not going, I'm not going to entertain that sultry novel or movie or anything like that and say, well, if God had given me a spouse, I wouldn't have to. No, rather, give thanks. God, you knew what you were doing with my life. You are Lord over my life, and so I give thanks. To the married person, it's Lord, I know my spouse is driving me nuts right now, but I give thanks. Your purposes, your design are good. And so I choose to stay in step with your heart, your design, and I choose to honor them and say no to anything that would keep me from a right relationship with you and a right relationship with them because your design is good. Thank you. I honor and worship you. And I, I, I say no to sin and yes to your will. To the person who's driving down the road and says, man, that tractor really looks so much better than my tractor. I really wish I had that tractor. Lord, why don't I have that tractor? And I'm being kind of funny, but at the same time, some of you know that's real, (laughs) okay? And it's saying, Lord, instead of saying what I don't have, the house, the retirement, the life, you name it, instead of saying, God, Why am I here? What did I do wrong? Where are you? What did you do wrong? Saying, God, for where I am in this moment, if there is anything I have done wrong, I confess it. I bring it to you. Have your way in me. But I choose in this moment not to covet, not to run after others' possessions, not to in my mind be constantly thinking about things that aren't mine things that you haven't given to me. You are good. You have given me yourself. I could be destitute like Job tomorrow and say, though you slay me, yet will I praise you. Lord, would that be my heart? Would that be the way that I see and know and understand you? And so Paul, he's, he's told the Ephesians to give thanks Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with who there is no partiality or shadow due to change. God isn't shifting. God isn't changing. God isn't trying to catch up to try to figure out, oh, well, I, I, you know, man, if I could just catch up with him, I, I could help him. I could do, no, that's not. Every good gift in your life comes down from God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we look to him and we trust him accordingly. We give thanks accordingly. And Paul also told the Ephesians that the way of of being God's children, the way that he's called us to respond to him, again, is saying no to these sins and yes to thanksgiving, yes to honoring God. And then he gives some very strong warning about the cost of not doing so. Verses five and six. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, I, I, just reading this week and studying this week, even though I've read this plenty of times, man, that sure makes your ears perk up. Makes you think, this is serious. How do we understand this? Okay, because no one in this room has or will maintain a perfect record in regards to coveting or a right view of our sexuality through all of our days. At some point, everyone in this room has or will fail to keep God's standard perfectly. So that could be really concerning. So we need to understand what this is saying. Okay, the, the person 
um, or it's, it's helpful to see that it says the person who is sexually moral or is impure or who is covetous. Okay, the person who chooses to live a life that identifies with the fallen, unredeemed nature, <clears throat> How, who chooses not to live as a child of God, to not live in the light, to not live as one who has been sacrificially loved, that person obviously does not believe what the Father has done and has not, no matter what comes out of their mouth, no matter how often they come to church, if they live in that way, it is clear that God is not their Father. Because God gives his inheritance to his children. And this person is saying, no, I don't want your inheritance. I want it now. I want this stuff. I want that person instead of my spouse or, or on my terms. That way of living denies the inheritance that God has said he wants to give his children. So again, looking at the word, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. This is a direct reference to being children of God. Now, I don't believe this, this means that God is giving and taking away or anything like that. I believe this is a revealing of the heart. I will not be perfect from this day forward in terms of not coveting. But I have a choice in how I respond to God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, when I'm convicted, saying, God, forgive me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for making a way for me. So I lay, a, I, I throw it aside. I nail it to the cross. Lord, cleanse me. Make me new. Make me like your child. Make me like Christ. Help me to say no to sin and yes to your will because I want to shine. I want to shine in this world that's so lost and confused and grappling just in a mud pit. I want them to see your light, your truth. I hope we're getting the picture here this morning. You know, Paul throws in this picture that helps us understand covetousness. He says, you know, he says that is, and I, the person who is covetous is an idolater. And I, I, think, I think we've gotten the picture this morning, but I just want to make sure. Someone who is coveting is someone who is looking to things to satisfy them rather than God. We've mentioned before that the antidote in part uh, to that is gratitude. But I would also say it's contentment. It's contentment saying, God, what you have given to me, I rejoice in, I give thanks for, and I choose to have that heart. To covet is to say that God is not good or just, and so I'm going to look to things instead of him to make me happy. If you want to know, and this has been useful to me, uh, someone told me years ago, he said, you want to know what your idols are? Ask yourself the question, if I only had, I would be happy. If I only had, and if the answer is anything besides Jesus, if it's anything besides Jesus, that's an idol. But, but okay, just process it for a minute. Anything that we say if I only had this instead of Jesus. You know, that's, that's what would make me happy. You know, the Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our hope. He is our salvation. He sustains us. My God sustains me. I give thanks for bread that he gives to me. I give thanks for each situation when I'm walking in the Spirit, I give thanks for all things because He's trustworthy. I know He's working all things together for my good because I've been called according to His purpose. And He's making me, He's conforming me into the image of His Son. And He's using all things to do that. So I'm, I'm trusting in Him in this process. So our end goal is to be able to say, if I only had Jesus, then I'd have everything. If he was first and foremost, then out of, that's the place that every, all of our life should flow out of. 
It says next, let no one deceive you with empty words. Okay, I, I believe that Paul is talking about the words of those who would make little of what God has said, whether Christian or not. Uh, but especially those who claim Christ. And I, I want to give a couple examples of deceptive speech that I have heard in our county and in our culture. Well, you know, kids are going to sow their wild oats. You know, you raise them up going to church and maybe, hopefully, they'll come back someday. Or something like that. God expects his children to walk in purity because he desires to shower the blessings of his design on them. A life lived in the grace and forgiveness of God is powerful whenever it comes. But the longer, the better. Amen? So there's no, in Christ's family, there's, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no allowance for wild oats. There is the call to purity and there is forgiveness when we fail. But we do not make light of that forgiveness by living however we want. Well, God's not a guy, against a guy or gal getting ahead in life, is he? No, but he made you to walk with him and to show you daily that he is trustworthy over all your life and that all that you have is his. Don't walk in a way that worships progress and the things that progress brings you and forget to worship the one you were put on this earth for. Well, don't you think God understands we all make a few mistakes? Yes, but how are you saying that question? Are you presuming on the grace of God that has bought you with his very own blood? Paul warns in, in Romans 6, don't do that. That is not a right response to God's love. He wants to save us from darkness and bring us into his glorious light. Don't minimize what God has said is right and true and good. That's, that's the way of a son of disobedience. Someone who rejects what God the Father has said. So don't agree with Satan's design. Don't agree with Satan's design. Darkness, the world that we live in, darkness hates the light, but the light has overcome the darkness. Amen? And I want to look at this last verse together. Bear with me and listen carefully. Verse 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Oh, I missed part. Verse 7, therefore do not associate with them. We are to be separate from those, from those who would say that they claim Christ and walk in this way. We have nothing to do with them because they're living a lie. To say that you're a child of God and yet live as a child of Satan and agreeing with things that are opposed to God, we have nothing to do with those who claim Christ yet live in this way. That's a strong statement. But we don't do that out of pride. We don't do that with our noses in the air. No, look at verse eight. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of the light. I have in my Bible penciled in there, I was. For at one time I was darkness. God has forgiven me for so much. He daily forgives me. And I call out to him and ask him for that forgiveness because I need it. And so we come at this not from a place where we're better than everybody else. As it, as it goes before the world, we don't pull ourselves out of the world because then how would they know? We're careful where we put ourselves. But again, that separation is talking about those who claim the name of Christ but are living in that way. No have nothing to do with them. But we're reaching out to the world saying, there is light that can penetrate your darkness. There is blood that can wash away all the wrong things that are stored up in your body that you have done wrong. He can wash you clean. There is one who lived a perfect life and gave it up for you. Trust in him and know the light and the joy, the freedom that he alone can give to you. It is there. Come to Jesus. Let him wash you clean. 
and then walk as children of the light so that the world would see. Because, folks, this is different. This is not just morality. This is being children of God, children of light, knowing his goodness and living it out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to praise your holy name for making a way for us. Lord, I, I, I don't doubt that there's been a lot of wrestling going on in a lot of hearts this morning. Heavenly Father, would you please shine your light? And Lord, I pray that every heart in this room would be open to your light. Lord, you don't shine your light on our shortcomings to shame us. You shine it, Lord, that we might give it to you and let you take it. Lord, thank you that you, though you knew no sin, you became sin for us. You were punished for our sin, that we might know life and joy and freedom from those things. Lord, I pray that no one in this room would walk away with things hidden, with things untouched by your grace, untouched by your light, untouched by your sacrificial love. Jesus, come and renew. Anyone in this room, call out to the Lord for forgiveness. Confess your sin before him. Repent. Lord, I've done what's evil in your eyes, and I thank you, I praise you, Lord. Would you, would you wash away my sin? Would you help me to walk rightly in a way that honors you? that honors what you have done, that is right for my place as your child. If you have not accepted Christ, if you have not accepted his forgiveness, I invite you this morning, call out to him for forgiveness, for his perfect life in your place. That's what he was doing at the cross. Receive his perfect record so that you can come before God. You're no longer held away from God because of your sin. Jesus has made a way for you to come to God, for you to know what it is to be saved from your sin and the punishment that you deserve. Call out to him for forgiveness and for new life. Jesus, have your way in your church this morning. Purify us, God. Purify us of all covetousness, all impurity all immorality, all talk that is not pleasing to you. Purify us, Lord, that we would shine, that we would shine as your children. We ask this in Jesus' name.